Welcome back to the Welsh History Podcast, episode 173, Stuarts and the Ambitious Men. The end of the Tudor era and the beginning of the Stuart monarchy did not usher in great change and a revolutionary situation in Wales or England, for that matter. Early on, much of what had been happening continued to happen. In fact, James's ascension to the throne was completely without conflict and was essentially met with fascination and glee. It seemed that it did not portend issues that would come later in the monarchy's dynasty. Most of the real change was happening in Ireland, where the Nine Years' War from 1594 to 1603 had come to a victorious end for the new king, an era that would start to promote Protestant landholders to displace others in Ulster, creating a hugely divisive problem for centuries to come in Ireland. There were many from all over the two islands who would also migrate to the Americas. From Newfoundland to Virginia, people of English, Irish, Scottish, and Welsh origins would settle in these regions, beginning the colonization on a mass scale. This would also be an era that would see massive change in Welsh as the Bible and various surrounding documents would be printed for the first time. Much as the King James Version of the Bible set in place the English Bible for centuries to come, this would also be the case with the Welsh Bible as we have discussed previously. This new Tudor offshoot branch, itself a Lancastrian offshoot, saw the King James VI of Scotland become King of England, and as the only legitimately close person who could take the throne of Elizabeth I, James brought with him a gaggle of issues. As we mentioned initially, everything seemed well, but the conflict between church and state, Catholic and Protestants, saw the flashpoint continue to increase and eventually explode. Within two years of being crowned, James had three different attempts to overthrow his monarchy, the most famous of which, in 1605, was the gunpowder plot, which saw Guy Fawkes and others try to blow up the Parliament in a failed coup. As the king was settling into rule in Wales, many rich and powerful and ambitious men were seeking their fortunes in England and elsewhere. There were many examples in the era of the early Stuarts and even a bit before of these men who rose to power increasingly because of their links in England were such examples such as lawyers Marmaduke Lloyd, David Jenkins, and Walter Rumsey, who were judicial powerhouses in the Great Sessions of Wales. Lloyd would climb the ranks in Wales, appointed by King James as the King's Attorney for Life in 1614, the same year he was appointed to the Council of Wales in the Marches. In 1622, he was knighted and then became a lower court justice of Chester that same year. He was also then named Chief Justice for Brecknock Circuit in 1636. His family was loyal to the Stuart regime and represented themselves as royalists both before and after the Civil War. David Jenkins was born in Pendulin, Glamorgan, and was the son of a well-established gentry family. He was called to the bar in 1609 and was appointed the Attorney General for South Wales and spent a number of years as a lawyer and eventually again as a judge. In March of 1643, he was appointed as a lower court judge of the Carmarthen Circuit of the Court of the Great Sessions. This was said to have happened against his will, not because he disputed becoming a lawyer or a judge, but rather because he saw this as the expense of the office exceeding the rewards that he would receive. When little is known of his life before the Civil War, one thing all agree on is that he made a great deal of his fortune due to his court positions, so the value of positions to increase his personal fortune would have been important to him. He would go on to be controversial in his opinions of religious interference in politics, something he disagreed with, and to chide the king on Charles's specific spending habits, and yet his loyalty to the crown was unquestioned, something he paid for during the parliamentary control of England under Cromwell. Walter Rumsey was the final justice who reached prominence in the legal profession in Wales during this period. 
Rumsey was born in Hanover, and he went to Oxford at 16 and rose to the bar in 1608, serving with distinction as Attorney General for South Wales at the same time as Jenkins. He would also make considerable wealth in this role. Rumsey was considered to be an excellent justice and would also serve as a lower court judge in the Brecon Court, and would eventually go on to be named as Chief Justice in 1637. Rumsey was noted to have been an erstwhile inventor, philosopher, and musician, all of which he seemingly excelled at. He wrote a book on the uses of coffee, which, among other things, included a cure for drunkenness, according to him. He was a true Renaissance man and another loyal royalist in the Stuart camp. Many others migrated from Wales to build their fortunes. In the Tudor period, we're going to go back a slight we're going to go back a slight bit and talk about Sir Richard Clough, a merchant of Denby who became one of the most powerful agents in the Elizabethan England. Clough was said to have gained fame in early childhood as a singer at the Chester Cathedral in the Boys' Choir. He would be sent to the court in London and very quickly took on more and more important roles, from being a marvelous singer to being a very clever and able financier. He was a factor, also called manager, for Thomas Gresham, a very rich and wealthy man in London, and was admitted into the Mercer's Company, a long-established guild of merchants who were exporting woolen materials and importing luxury fabrics. His training and acumen in trade meant that he would continue to rise up the ranks very quickly. In 1552, he was sent to Antwerp to work with commerce and banking in industries in the region, which had become the most powerful in Europe of this period. In 1561, he would write to Gresham about setting up some sort of exchange in England. Gresham followed that up by setting up the London Royal Exchange. In fact, we have a lot of information on what went on in the, that period because of these letters, because uh, Clough was very much a writer and described all sorts of things from his financial affairs to the exchanges they were making to dealing with fellow traders in the area we now call Belgium to as well just different public day-to-day -day things from riots to church services to building designs and everything in between. He was fascinated by a number of different topics and subjects. The exchange which was set up was purely a mercantile exchange market, at the time meant as a house where one and only type of commercial sales could take place. In fact, there was a note that stock exchangers were actually banned from the area because they were considered to be too rowdy. Uh, it was given its royal commission in 1571, which would remain a building of importance all through the colonial and imperial periods. It still exists to this day, in fact, although the building continued to suffer under various fires in London. And what we have now is the 1844 building that was built after yet another fire had happened. Clough accumulated, of course, a considerable fortune during his life in his rags to riches story. With the influence of Gresham, he invested heavily in crown lands and his activities gave rise to a local Denby expression, not in use so much today, but apparently was in use for a while, called he had become a clough, as in to refer that he had acquired this person had acquired great wealth. Clough would return to Wales late in his life and would settle back in the Denby area, erecting the first brick-only house in Wales, which created a local stir due to the alien nature of the construction. The buildings were based on Flemish architecture and in fact brought over Flemish architects to help build it, something that would of course be familiar to Clough in his experience over there and his wife, who herself was Flemish, but was completely foreign and fantastic to the locals, so much so that they continued to talk about it long after he had passed away and was still considered to be a tourist trap to some degree up until at least the middle of the 1700s. Hi, 
I'm Mark Machado, broadcaster and Sri Lankan cricket fan. Every week, Estelle Vazu, Devon and myself will drop several episodes of Sri Lanka on 99.94, keeping you up to date on the latest from the Sri Lankan cricketing world. If you want to know what Hasaranga is up to, where Chabri Athapattu scored her runs, or what Naroshan Dickwaller has been discussing behind the stumps, then make sure to watch or listen to Sri Lanka on 99.94. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts, on YouTube and on the 99.94 for app. Join the Shrunken Crooked Conversation and get involved. A news story gets shared by a friend on social media or you catch a tweet that really makes your blood boil. But how do you separate fact from fiction? That's the premise behind Disinformation, a 10-part series from Evergreen Podcasts and Emergent Risk International coming this fall. Tune in to Disinformation wherever you get your podcasts. And remember, don't believe everything you read. On the other hand, William Vaughn was the son of Walter Vaughn, and he was descended from wealthy men in the Carmarthenshire area. He was educated at Oxford and would eventually drop out of school for a little while before taking his bar exam in 1600. He would receive his law doctorate in 1605 after touring around Europe. In 1616, he became the first Welshman to attempt to settle a colony in the New World. We mentioned a few episodes prior about the later 17th century settlement of Pennsylvania by William Penn and the Welsh tract that still exists till to this day. In 1616, Vaughan had bought land in the southern Avalon Peninsula of the island of Newfoundland. The year later, he set up a colony of Welsh settlers on the island in an area now called Renews, which is a small fishing village 52 miles south of St. John's, the capital of Newfoundland. The colony he called Cambrial was an obvious reference to the Welsh name in Latin, Cambriae. Vaughan was said to be concerned about the economic conditions in Wales and in the early 17th century became interested in establishing a colony in Newfoundland He saw this as his way to create a new home, a little Wales in the new world, and offer something to people who didn't have a lot, obviously affected by the economic misery that was seen in some parts of Wales at this time. In 1617 and again in 1618, he obtained the service of Richard Whitbourne and sent out two groups of settlers to his colony at his own expense to establish roots there and to develop the colony. He then sent Whitburn up as the governor of the area. Of the two ships that were chartered in 1618 to take colonists, only one arrived to pick up the colonists because the other one was attacked and taken over by pirates. A Not a great omen for what was to come, as you might say. He was meant to go with them at the time, this being Vaughn, but due to ill health was unable to travel until 1622. The winter of 1617-18, to along with the typically unprepared colonists, meant the little colony immediately struggled. Few were ready to deal with the harsh climate and shorter growing seasons in Newfoundland. The colony continued for several years, but was never really able to establish itself, due in part to the climate, but also due to raids from French troops and other settlers, such as other fishermen in the area, continually stealing and thieving from them. The colony, of course, struggled along for a number of years after that, but under accusations of being lazy, when I think more commonly the problem would be that most of the settlers, you know, if you're living in Wales, you assume things would grow and produce in similar fashions with similar yields. But when you get to Newfoundland, where snow is more common, where, you know, sea ice is still around for quite some time into the spring, where a growing season is much less and you have to get it done quickly and you have to put up with all the problems that entails, then it's a completely different set of circumstances and would certainly make it much more difficult for people unfamiliar with this. Something that a lot of colonies had, this wasn't just this particular one. The colony lasted until somewhere between 1630 or 1637. Nobody's really sure. We just know the last activity that we have traced is in 1630. And in 1637, the area was completely abandoned and bought up by someone else who then created the full colony of Newfoundland. 
early colonial efforts, of course, made similar fates and up and down the English New World, so this is hardly a surprising situation. Settlers were told that the territory was the land of milk and honey, a new Garden of Eden, one might even say. But when it's obvious that things were very different on arrival, stories would then be carried back to Britain where others were less excited to take a risk of death, pirates, and a miserable life of unknown. All of that question and conflict that would arise from all of that would be something that would be very difficult to muster interest and enthusiasm over. Certainly, I would understand that if I was them at the time. The final Welsh person of importance I wanted to discuss during this era, during both the early Stuart reign and the end of the Elizabethan one, is Sir Thomas Button. Button was born in Whirlton, Glamorgan, to an English father and a Welsh mother, Margaret Lewis. Through marriage, he was related to Sir Robert Mansell, an admiral in the Royal Navy and eventual member of Parliament, who was relatively controversial at the time, but Mansell's patronage helped to establish Button's career in the Navy and allowed him to achieve quite amazing things in the process. This was a period when the British Navy was obsessed with finding the Northwest Passage, that elusive route that had to gone across the top of North America that would then lead to the Pacific Ocean. Of course, at this time, when most of North America was unknown, people thought it would just be a quick river valley trip through and you would break out into the open ocean, in part because some mistaken geography, in part because they just weren't sure. And of course, as time went on and they reached these so-called open waters, it became very obvious that these weren't open at all. Probably the first big one to be noted here, of course, is the arrival to the Great Lakes, which if you've ever seen the Great Lakes, specifically Lake Superior, you can be at points where you don't see any side of it. And then all of a sudden you hit the other side. So all of that created issues. And so they continued to go farther and farther north to find some way around. And in doing such, gentlemen such as Henry Hudson came to the fore. Hudson, in 1611, after many journeys over to the other side of the world, had once again tried to continue to move forward in 1611, only to have his own crew mutiny against him and leave him for dead in the bay they had discovered, which at the time I don't even think they fully understood was a bay. It was at this point that Button was tasked with finding the passage, rumored to be a massive body of water Hudson had discovered, which, of course, was Hudson's Bay, not the open ocean. As part of his role, Button was also to try and find Hudson and his remaining crew, which included his son and five others, a task which, of course, we now know he failed entirely, as did succeeding attempts to try and find Hudson. In April 1612, he was given command of two Navy ships, the Resolution and Discovery, to lead an expedition in search of the Northwest Passage. Sailing from England around the beginning of May 1612, they reached the mouth of the river, which he then named Nelson, after the ship's master who had passed away. They spent the winter in 1612 in Port Nelson, as it would eventually be called, and in the spring of 1613 headed north to search for the Northwest Passage. They lost the resolution to sea ice, but continued onward, reaching 65 degrees north, which, if you look at a map, that's an incredible distance to the north. Button discovered and named Mansell Island, but made it no farther that year, and returned to England in September of 1613. He was credited, however, with exploring the entire west coast of Hudson's Bay, naming the area New Wales. The region would again be visited 12 years later in 1631 by Captains Thomas James and Luke Fox. Supposedly, after discovering a cross erected by Button at Port Nelson, Captain Fox christened the shore north of the Nelson River as New North Wales and all of the land south as New South Wales, a naming convention that was done well before it was done in Australia, as it turned out. Button and his men were some of the first to see this territory, which we now know to be either Nunavut or the province of Manitoba, and with 
Hudson were able to map out the region of Hudson's Bay, establishing that they would have to sail considerably further if they wanted to reach the Pacific. And yet, they accomplished a number of incredible and amazing things even in that point in time, trying to take sailing ships through what would quite often be completely ice-covered waters and having to wait for warm periods and having to set up and establish camps in areas which were, for the most part, very difficult to live in. I mean, the, one of the reasons why we assume Hudson ran into trouble and ended up with a mutiny in the first place was because he tried to overwinter in Hudson's Bay. And at the end of winter, when he tried to continue to go west, his crew decided that they did not want to go west and would no longer accept the captain's point of view in this matter and then revolted on him. All of this means that it was dangerous, it was complex, and it was something where your achievements may not even be fully understood until very much later. All of this was fascinating to note, and like as I pointed out at the beginning, these were achievements done by Welsh people who were leaving Wales in order to seek fame and fortune, and in some cases just trying to get out of poverty and all of which saw them accomplish great things. Certainly for every one of them, there are hundreds of others who caught fish every day or grew crops every day or, you know, serviced and helped people in their community every day and did a hundred of other things that are of just as import and just as notable, but as so often happens in these circumstances in history, what we have noted is those that make these achievements that become bigger than themselves. And in a way, it's both something we have to live with, but something we have to understand as well, that there will always be these different measures of people. And to remember that for every, you know, sir, so-and-so, there are hundreds thousands of other people who aren't being recognized who are contributing just as much if not more and of course you also notice that in all of this we didn't mention a single woman while i could have mentioned the wives of these men that would all it would be it'd be the names of them because we literally have nothing else to go on because typically they're only noted for what their fathers did <laughs> so with all that said and done keep all that in mind and in the back of your mind that we're still looking and thinking about all of these other people and the struggles and strife they're going through. And in fact, many of the colonists that will cross over from Wales to the Americas build their own lives and, and make their own ways in fascinating and exciting ways that aren't we haven't even reached yet. We're just at the very beginning of all of this change and of all of this advancement. But you can see already just how dominant this has become in the lives of everyone. The settlement of the new world and the colonization of it is going to become an obsession, which will continue for many years to come, and will be the basis on why Britain goes from being a backwater island effectively in Europe to becoming a superpower. And with that... I'd like to thank you all for listening. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, you can always reach me at the Welsh History Podcast at gmail.com. You can also talk to me on Twitter at Welsh History Pod or on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Welsh History Podcast. I generally try and answer questions as quickly as possible or comments or anything and, uh, Thank you so much for all of you who do send in comments and questions and just generally participate in this podcast. You are amazing and I really appreciate it. And if you would like to contribute to the podcast and help us to continue to acquire the knowledge and the research and all of those kind of things, you can do so at patreon.com for slash Welsh history. Thank you all for listening. Have yourselves a great day. We'll talk to you next time. Take care. Bye bye. Been a Distractions Media production. And for everything we do, check out distractionsmedia.com. 
A news story gets shared by a friend on social media, or you catch a tweet that really makes your blood boil. But how do you separate fact from fiction? That's the premise behind Disinformation, a 10-part series from Evergreen Podcasts and Emergent Risk International coming this fall. Tune in to Disinformation wherever you get your podcasts. And remember, don't believe everything you read.